Have you ever wondered how to calculate the speed of moving vehicles using computer vision? In this video, I will explore the whole process from object detection to tracking to speed estimation. Along the way, we'll confront the challenges of perspective distortion and learn how to overcome it with OpenCV and a little bit of math. So fasten your seatbelts and enjoy the ride. You see what I did there? By the way, the whole code you will see in this tutorial is open sourced. You will find it on GitHub. The link is in the description below. Okay, we start in pretty much empty Python script. All I have is a way to pass source video path as an input. Let's go ahead and import supervision as SV. That's a computer vision library that we will use to do all sorts of useful things in this project. We start by creating an instance of frame generator that we will use to loop over frames of our input video. For now, the for loop will be empty. We go back to our imports. We will need to import from inference models utils import get roboflow model. And just above our frame generator, we will load our model. To do it, we call get roboflow model and pass the name of our checkpoint. In our case, YOLO V8X with 640 input resolution. Now we just run the inference on every frame in our for loop and convert the result into supervision detections object. Once we do it, we can use supervision to easily create nice looking visualizations. Supervision has almost 20 different annotators and you can customize and combo them for even more unique results. If you want to explore, the link to supervision docs is in the description below. Now we'll use probably the simplest annotator in a supervision package, bounding box annotator to just draw the boxes on the frame. We'll select a hard-coded thickness of four for now. Now inside the for loop, we'll create a copy of our current frame, call it annotated frame and reassign the result of bounding box annotator annotate method to it. The last thing that we need to do is use OpenCV to display the result on the screen. We'll add a small break mechanism. I know it looks simple, but trust me, it will get a lot more complex along the way. By the way, in my script, I'm using Roboflow Inference P package, but you can very easily swap it for Ultralytics YOLO or YOLO NAS or any other model. You just need to change a few lines in your code and you should be good to go. It would be nice to make our annotations just a little bit more interesting. So to do it, we'll add additional label annotator that will for now display the class name of the object that we detected. But before we do this, let's use two smart methods coming from Supervision P package to figure out the optimal line thickness and text scale for our frame resolution. Now we will pass the thickness to our bounding box annotator and thickness and text scale into our label annotator. And once we do this, we will go uh, back into our for loop and below bounding box annotator call, we will add additional overlay with our labels. Unfortunately, object detection is not enough to perform speed estimation. To calculate the distance traveled by each car, we need to be able to track them. And to do that, we will use byte track coming together with supervision P package. If you want to learn more about plugging it into your detection project, head over to Supervision Docs page. There you will find end-to-end -end examples showing you how you can do it with different detection models. The link is in the description below. Let's do it. Adding a tracking into your existing object detection project is actually very simple. All we need to do is create the instance of byte track. We will pass a frame rate because byte track depending on that information in the constructor. And then in our for loop below our detection, we will just call byte track update with detections and that's it. Now we can add a little bit more flavor into our annotators and just loop over our track ID values, uh, create labels and pass them into label annotator. Seems like our tracking works as expected. 
However, I'm a little bit concerned about those small detections that are far away from the camera. Those tend to be less stable, blinking from time to time. Anytime this happens, we risk our tracker will increase the tracker ID. To get rid of some of those unwanted detections, we will once again use supervision. To be precise, it's polygon zone filtering feature. We start by just pasting the list of vertices of our polygon zone. By the way, don't worry, I will explain how did they get those coordinates in just a few minutes. Now let's go just below frame generator definition and create our polygon zone. Pass NumPy array with vertices as well as information about a frame resolution. And between our detection and tracking, we will add detection filtering based on whether or not the detection is inside or outside the polygon zone. Let's draw our newly added polygon zone on the frame. Just for debugging purposes, it will make it a lot easier for us to confirm that all unwanted detections are indeed removed. Now, let's take a look side by side. And we can see that Polygon Zone have managed to successfully remove those unwanted detections. By the way, if you would like to learn more about using zones in computer vision, not only for filtering, quite recently we've released an awesome video covering this topic, showing how you can leverage zones for advanced traffic analysis. The link is in the top right corner. Finally, we can talk about speed. In principle, it is very simple. Speed is the measure of how fast the object moves. It is calculated by dividing the distance the object travels by the time it takes to cover the distance. So how can we estimate the speed of moving object using computer vision? For a second, let's consider a simplistic approach where the distance is estimated based on the number of pixels the bounding box moves. Here's what happens when you use dots to memorize the position of the car every one second. As we can see, even when the car moves at consistent speed, the pixel distance it covers varies. The further away it is from the camera, the smaller the distance it covers. As the result, it will be very hard for us to use raw image coordinates to calculate the speed. We need a way to transform the coordinates in the image into actual coordinates on the road, removing the perspective-related distortion along the way. Fortunately, we can do it fairly easily using OpenCV. So let's go to drawing board and let me show you how to perform a perspective transformation with OpenCV. So here is a single frame coming from our video and we can see that on the left and on the right side of the road, there are those vertical markings. And we can see that on the image, the distance between those markings is different and they are getting closer and closer the further away they are from the camera. And in reality, there is always 50 meters between them. So now how do we convert our perspective to make those distances equal? So we first create this trapezoidal shape and call it our source region of interest. And what we would like to do is to convert it into our target region of interest. And the target region of interest looks more like a road but from the bird eye view. So it's pretty much a rectangle. And I done my research, the road is 25 meters wide and around 250 meters long. This is because we have five sections between those markings and each section is like I said, 50 meters. So the target region is 25 meters by 250 meters. Now to convert between those regions, we will need to convert between a coordinate systems. The first coordinate system uh, originates in the top left corner of the image. Here is our point zero, zero, and the Y axis is coming from top to bottom of the image. The X axis is coming from left to right. The resolution of the image is 3840 by 2160. And our source region of interest is defined, as, as I said, as a 
trapezoidal shape with A, B, C, D vertices. And we would like to convert it into rectangle with A prime, B prime, C prime, and D prime vertices. So I spent a little bit of time and I figure out what are the coordinates of points A, B, C, and D. So it's uh, 1252 by 787 and 2298 by 803. Now let's get a little bit more interesting with points C and D because they're outside of the image. So I assumed that they will be lying on the bottom edge of the image. So that's why I get the coordinates 2159. And I get it by subtracting one from 2160 because uh, we start to count from zero. So we need to compensate for that. And that's why we need to subtract one. The final coordinate of point C is 5039 by 2159. In the case of point D, it gets even crazier because the Y axis stays the same, the Y coordinates stay the same, but we go into the negative side on the X axis and we actually get minus 550. As for the target region is actually way simpler. All we need to do is use the dimensions of our rectangle the coordinate system starts in point A prime, and we just use the dimensions to figure out the coordinates of points B prime, C prime, and D prime. We just need to remember to subtract one because once again, we start to count from zero, not from one. Now, our transformation is really interesting because the whole red section of our source region will get transformed into this fairly small section of the target region. And what is even cooler is that the small blue section of the source region of interest will at the end get transformed into equally sized section of the target region. So we see that stuff that is far away will get bigger and stuff that is close will get smaller. How do we get that transformation? So OpenCV allows us to do that. All we need to do is prepare our region of interest data. So we need to put our source region of interest vertices into the metrics. The metrics need to be two dimensional. Every row in that metrics uh, is the coordinate of one point from our source region of interest. And we need to do the same, but for our target region. So this time A prime, B prime, C prime, and D prime. And the first row in our case will be zero, zero, etc. That will allow us to calculate M matrix. And it will be the result of calling get perspective transform uh, method from OpenCV. All we need to do is pass our source and target NumPy arrays and we will get our M metrics. Then we can use that M metrics to do something magical. So our object detector provides us with the result in the form of bounding boxes. We can use one of the points from that bounding box to define that bounding box. I'm usually using bottom center of the bounding box. Here I'm calling those points D1, D2, D3 and D4. And we can use matrix M to convert our points from the source region of interest into target region of interest. So you can see those small dots on the edge of red section. Those are transformed points. Um, and we can use matrix M to do that. All we need to do is define um, a input data uh, in the form of once again to the uh, matrix we put uh, coordinates of each point as the row in that matrix. And we can calculate our points prim, which is pretty much points in our target region of interest by calling a perspective transform past those points and additionally our M matrix and that's it. Now let's try to code it. I just start by pasting the information about width and height, as well as the vertices of the target region of interest. Now let's implement a small utility called view transformer 
that will pretty much execute the logic that we discussed a few minutes ago. So in constructor, it will take source and target NumPy arrays. Those will be the vertices of our source and target region of interest. We just need to make sure that those NumPy arrays are in float32 uh, format because get perspective transform function expects those NumPy array to be in this D type. Things get slightly more complicated in transform points method, and that's because perspective transform from OpenCV expects points to be defined in 3D space, not on the 2D plane. So we need to add this additional dimension of those kind of like empty dummy information. We need to do that so that our data will go through perspective transform. And after that's done, we just remove this extra dimension. Now that we are ready, we can create an instance of our view transformer. We can do it right over our for loop. And now inside the for loop below our tracker, we first convert our bounding boxes into a list of points. We can do it using supervision. We just need to specify the point that we are looking for. As I said, I'm going for bottom center. And then we transform that list using our view transformer to go from our source to our target region of interest. Last but not least, we can use label annotator to display those coordinates on the output video. We can see that as vehicles distance themselves from the top left corner of our region of interest, there is a corresponding increase in the values of X and Y. That's exactly what we wanted. As the bonus, we can calculate the relative distance between the cars. Here we witness a hazardous situation when one car is dangerously close to another. Now let's go back to drawing board and learn how we can use those coordinates to finally calculate our speed. We already have our detector and tracker set up. That means that every frame we get a set of bounding boxes along with tracker IDs assigned to them. So here it is, number one, two, three, and four. And that allows us to track those objects, how they move in time. So here is the position of the object now, but here is the position of the object a second ago and two seconds ago. And each of those positions get a separate set of coordinates. Now it's X, Y, but a second ago it was X1, Y1, and two seconds ago it was X2, Y2. Now, of course, those points will get transformed and they will end up uh, on our target region of interest. But when that happens, it will turn out that uh, those points will, will be pretty much on a straight line because that's a straight road. And that means that the X coordinate uh, and X, Y and X2 coordinates are pretty much the same. All that changes is the Y coordinate. So to calculate the distance traveled by the car in the last second, all we need to do is subtract y from y1 and take it all in the absolute. And that's our distance. The time is, like I said, one second. So in the end, our speed is distance divided by the time. Um, and that will be defined in meters per second. So if we would like to get the speed in kilometers per hour, we would need to multiply our value times 3.6 and that's it. Like you saw, to calculate the speed, we will need to be able to look in the past. So we will need to be able to say where the car was, let's say a second ago. And to do it, we will create a Python dictionary and we'll store coordinates of the car in the past. So every frame will just add this coordinate to this dictionary. And inside the dictionary, we'll use DQ, and that DQ will have a set length that will be, uh, in our case, 25, because that's our frame rate. That means that we'll always store the coordinates of the car over the last second, and we'll probe 25 times a second. Here we just loop over our tracker ID and points. And what we do is we add, uh, like I said, we add the Y coordinates to our coordinates dictionary. One thing that I forgot to mention is bounding box flickering. This is a tiny movement of bounding boxes up and down and left and right that can be pretty much defined as a noise. 
but when our coordinate measurements are done very close in time, that noise can lead to a gigantic inaccuracy in our speed estimation. So optimally, what we would like to have is two coordinate measurements that are a half, maybe a second from each other. Then the distance traveled by the car is proportionally way larger than those small inaccuracies and our speed estimation should be just fine. We get rid of our initial labels formatting, define empty labels list above our for loop and check whether or not our DQ related to that specific tracker ID is at least half full. If that's not the case, then as a fallback, we'll just display the tracker ID. However, if we have enough information, we'll calculate the speed. We'll use the first and the last element in coordinates DQ to calculate the distance and the time, because if our DQ is not full, it can be less than a second. Finally, we just divide the distance by the time, multiply by 3.6, and that's our speed that we can now display as a label using label annotator. Well, it took us a long time to get here, but we finally see the speed next to our moving cars. We also can see that there is a short period of time where there is only tracker ID. This is the time where we don't have enough information to calculate the speed yet. Now it's time for some final touches. One thing that I always like to have when I track object is trace annotator. It displays the route that the object traveled over the past few seconds. In our case, we'll go for two seconds and we'll pin that route to the bottom center of the bounding box of each object. Now let's do some formatting so that the lines wouldn't be so long. And now we can change the position of the label. The default one is top left. We will do the bottom center so that the label will be just below the bounding box. Now we can go into the annotation section, remove the line that was drawing our zone and replace it with trace annotation. And the last small thing that we can do is to change the color mapping. So up until now, the colors of the bounding boxes were related to the class. And now we will change the mapping to the tracker ID. It means that every object on the frame will have different color and that will just create a more interesting visualization. Let's take a look at the final results. And that's it. I'm super happy that we finally had an opportunity to record a video on speed estimation. That was on my personal to-do list for probably a year now. So having it as the topic of the first video in 2024, it's just awesome. Having said that, it took me a lot of time to produce this video, making all the demos, visualizations and whiteboard explanations all together took several dozens of hours. So I really, really hope that you will like it. And if you did, make sure to like and comment to help the algorithm find it. Of course, there is so much more you can do with speed estimation. Like for example, this small app that color codes cars based on their speed. I hope this video will inspire you to build something even cooler. As usual, make sure to like and subscribe and stay tuned for more computer vision content coming to this channel soon. My name is Peter and I'll see you next time. Bye.